Hello folks, and welcome to my talk on Outrageous Performance. My name is Max Demarzi, and I'm developing RageDB. You can find out more on maxdemarzi.com and ragedb.com, or you can look us up on Twitter or GitHub. And what you'll see is that I am a graph addict, and RageDB is obviously a graph database. But before I begin our tale, I want to start off with a sad story about outrageously bad performance. Once upon a time, back in 2020, some folks at Microsoft built a distributed graph called A1. The details are in the paper, I'm going to skip them for now, and jump right into the performance test. They built a huge cluster, 245 machines, each one with 120 gigs of RAM and two of these Intel E52673s. What in the world are those things? They are CPUs with 12 cores each, and they have 245 servers. So if you do the math, you're talking about 5,880 cores on this cluster, almost 6,000 cores on this cluster. It's the ultimate dream for a lot of people, a massively distributed in-memory graph database. You know, can you imagine the kind of performance they got? Well, you don't have to imagine, because the paper actually tells us. They performed a two-hop query. So imagine they're going to Steven Spielberg here, and they're going to go to the movies that Steven Spielberg directed, and then the actors who were in those movies, and they got a count. And when they ran their test, they managed to get 20,000 queries per second in their test. Now think about that. 20,000 queries per second with almost 6,000 cores. 20,000 queries, 6,000 cores. That's uh, three and a half queries per second per core if you do the math. That is outrageously bad performance. But why? Why was it so bad? Well, they tell us. 99.6% right? of the neighbors of a node were on a different machine. So can you imagine every time you ask for a relationship, you have to traverse not just the network, but the actual physical network and take a network hit and say, hey, where's your data look like? I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing that they did this. But we're not here to talk about sad stories. Why are we here? We're here to answer the big question. Not, not an existential crisis, but the future, right? To prepare. You are, 99, you are at P99Conf because you want to prepare yourself, your peers, and your organization for the future that is yet to come. And that future has so many cores. You have 56 cores from Intel, 64 cores from Amazon, 96 from AMD, 128 from Alibaba, 144 from NVIDIA, and these are what's out there today. And all of these core counts from each of these vendors are going to increase next year and the year after that. And there's even a rumor that there's a 384 core CPU from AMD coming in 2025. We'll see if it pans out to be true. So in this multi-core future, we are going to have to deal with it. And this is where the CSTAR framework comes in. So CSTAR is an open source C++ framework designed for building server applications. So the idea here is you're going to use a shared nothing model that puts all the requests on individual cores. So imagine if each core was a separate server. And instead of using logs, it's going to share information between the CPU cores by passing messages using features and promises that don't allocate memory and they support continuation so you can keep going one feature at a time. On top of that, they also provide high performance networking, including DPDK, and it comes with an HTTP server, which we're actually going to use for RageDB. So the big message here is, in the future, think about distributing on cores, not on servers. Because one core talking to another core is orders of magnitude faster than two servers talking to each other over the network. And this network doesn't fail. Well, I mean, unless your CPU fails, and then you're, you get bigger problems. It's a way to think about it is like distributed systems on training wheels, right? You have a lot less things to worry about. Now, distributing a graph is hard. It's actually NP hard, unless P equals NP, but then you get all the problems. So how are we going to do this? All right. We are going to take advantage of the shards that CSTAR provides. Each core is going to act like its own server and each shard is going to control a piece of the graph. What this means in practice is that a single shard is going to control a node and its properties, as well as that node's outgoing relationships and the properties of those outgoing relationships. A shard is also going to keep a list of all the incoming relationship links that it doesn't control. In other words, the relationships, IDs that are coming in from other nodes, but not the properties and not the, the rest of it. 
These are controlled by the other shards. And the reason we need to keep the, both the incoming and the outgoing links is because we want to support two-way traversals. So we can go from one node to the other and then backwards. Now, the way this works in RageDB is that we're going to require every node to have a single type and a key. So you can imagine a user node that has a username for a key. We're going to hash the type and key, and we're going to bucket into one of our shards. And each member, each shard corresponds to one CPU core. So by using this, this method that I stole from Daniel Lemire, we're going to randomly distribute our nodes into these cores, into these shards. Now, to add a node, you know, we do the hashing, figure out which shard it belongs to, and pass it onto that shard. Then that shard is going to add it to a vector, depending on what type it is. And that's going to give it an, an internal node ID. So if it happens to be the first user node, it's going to go to uh, position 1 and get stored in, in that vector at that position 1. And then we can use that internal ID plus the type to generate these external IDs, which is what the rest of the, uh, the graph will use to talk to it. The properties are going to be added by their internal IDs. So if you're looking for the name of a node at position 1, well, then you look for the, the name vector that has a string property and look at position 1. That is where it's going to be. That's going to make it easy to find these, um, these properties for these nodes by using the actual internal identifiers for everything as array positions. You don't have to hash anything, you just go to exactly to that spot you need to. And then you can flip-flop between internal and external IDs. So anything outside of the local shard is going to be referring to nodes and relationships using the external ID. Anything inside the shard is going to use the internal ID. And we're going to carve up this 64-bit space to make room for the shard, the type of node, and the internal shard ID. So I'm allowing 10 bits for a core, so you can go all the way up to 1,024 cores. That should give us about 10 years before we have to change that. You get 16 bits for the type. So a user would be uh, one type of node, a server, you know, a software, switch, will all be different types of nodes. You can have up to 65,000 of them, so that's plenty. Most graphs I've seen have only a few dozen. And then you get 38 bits for the ID space. So we can only hold up to 275 a billion nodes and billion relationships, which is pretty fine for now. All right, the worst thing you can do in a graph database is deleting a node. And it's as much fun as getting a colonoscopy. You know, thankfully, it's a rare operation, but it requires a lot of coordination. You have to message the shards that control the incoming relationships and delete them and their properties. And you have to delete our outgoing relationships and message the shards that have a copy of the links to those outgoing relationships and ask them to delete them as well. Then we delete the actual node and then we delete its properties. So if you want to see an example of a lot of shard coordination using the CSTAR framework, take a look at the methods for deleting a node in the graph. I'm going to spare you and not, not show you that. Now, RageDB is built on a simple four-layer design. On the surface, you have HTTP and JSON. These are all already provided by CSTAR, so you don't actually have to do any work. Underneath that, we have an optional layer in Lua that runs in a single thread. And you can use it if you want to send Lua code, or you can use the straight HTTP API to get your responses. Now, both of these two layers sit on top of the peered layer, which acts like coordinator between the shards. So if you want to get anything from the graph, you have to go through this peered layer, which is going to determine who is actually going to handle their request. And at the bottom layer, you have the actual shard layer, which controls the data that you're asking for. So let's look at an example. This is a pseudocode example. It's been cleaned up a little bit to make it easier to read for presentation purposes. But our HTTP server has a handler that says get node. So we're requesting for a node to come back, and we're passing in a request and expecting a reply. We have a parameter of type and a parameter of key. So we're going to take our local shard and send this request and say, get me a node from the peered layer. Now, that server, that shard rather, is going to figure out what shard has access to that node and then return a node back. If the node ID happens to be zero, we say, sorry, we couldn't find it. So we're just going to return our 404. If we did find it, we're going to turn it into JSON and send it back. So. Let's take a look at that node get peered method in detail. Here's the actual code. So it's going to calculate the shard ID based on the type and key. And then based on that shard ID, it's going to send a message to the shard 
of that node and say, hey, go get me the node and key based on this type and this uh, key that I care about. And that's how it works. All of these return futures, so nothing's uh, waiting to just passing features around. The HTTP layer is going to respond in JSON. You can talk to it directly from your browser, from any programming language. It doesn't require a database driver or any kind of fancy custom protocol. You don't have to convert anything to anything. It's just HTTP and JSON is as universal as it can get. We also have a Lua layer. And we're using Lua as a query language because it's proven in the field, right? It's being used in a lot of embedded systems and in a lot of video games that need performance. We're using Lua JIT, which is the fastest uh, Lua that's available out there. And it's a very powerful language, but it's really small. People can learn it in a couple of days, a couple of hours if, they're, if they concentrate. And you have millions of kids who are learning Lua via Roblox, that game that your kids are addicted to. So in a generation or, or about 10 years or so, you can have all these programmers, hopefully, that already know how to write Lua code. And we're going to make them use uh, Lua to write some queries. So the Lua layer takes whatever the last line of the query is and turns it into JSON. For example, here we have a node get. It's asking for a, a user that has a username of max. And whatever the last line is going to get converted into JSON. It's so simple queries are easy to write. You can also do pipeline queries. You want to do a bunch of stuff. I want to get a node ID. I want to get a different node. I want to get some counts. I want to get some relationships. I'm going to use the result of one and feed it into a different method. Perfectly valid. And at the end, we just return all five of these. And it turns them all into JSON and brings them back. And it doesn't matter whether these things are related or not, but it lets you do these kind of pipeline queries. And Really complex queries can also be done. So in this case, we have a names table, and we're getting the users who are related to Max here. We're grabbing the property name, and we're adding it to the names table, and then bringing back that result set. And I'll show you an example later of a, a more complex query, but it can be literally anything you want that you can express in Lua with these special um, graph database methods sprinkled in to make your life easier. And the whole thing is sandboxed so that you don't have any bad code hopefully running on the server, if I sandbox it correctly. And we use the Sol2 library to interface with C++, which is the fastest Lua library that I've seen talk to C++. It comes with a UI that's being served directly from CSTAR, so there's no additional application code running anywhere. And here, for example, we see um, it running some bulk methods to traverse about 50 million relationships in a couple of seconds. So you're doing a ton of work here very quickly and getting our, our answer back. Now, you can't be a P99Conf without some P99 numbers. So here's an example of a performance test running 190,000 requests per second using WRK2. And you can see the latency is ridiculously low. The request per second is very, very high. But we can actually do better than this. If we turn on DPDK and try this query again, we jump up to 280,000 requests per second. Now, the data plane development kit lets us skip the network driver and talk to the network art directly. And this works even on the cloud. So these tests were run on a cloud server on AWS. Now, obviously here, I'm just getting a node without any properties. So it's a really um, hello world type of query that's not doing much. But a lot of databases can't even handle a hello world at this, this speed. The entire system is open source. So feel free to take a look. If you are in the market for a graph database, or if you want to learn how to use the CSTARM framework for your future projects, and you want to take a look at an example of how I did it, which as a Java developer is a little bit weird probably, but at least I tried. Uh, or if you want to help out, uh, feel free to drop me a note on GitHub or Twitter or by email. And um, let's work together on this. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time.